Yo, what's good, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Gift of Who's Podcast. I'm pretty sure this is episode 57, but if not, we all make mistakes. And I'm joined here today by two of the most passionate Magic fans that I know in my inner circle of NBA stuff. We did the pod last year where, yes, we talked for 30 minutes about Jonathan Isaac. I can't wait to see what happens on this podcast. I'm joined here today by Steven and also Beyond the RK. Guys, feel free to introduce yourselves to the people. Yo, what's going on? Steven Cameron with uh, Orlando Magic HQ. Um, yeah, psyched to talk to some talk to some talk to some Magic fans, even the haters in the comments, uh, and talk to you, gifted, about some Orlando Magic. Hey, we're always here for the haters and the real yes. fans. You know, we gotta set them straight. Uh, I'm Ryan Kaminsky, Beyond the RK on Twitter, repping Swish Theory, and excited to be here. Talk some Magic hoops as always. Absolutely. Um, please check out our last episode because, again, we dove into a lot of things before the Magic had their success. A lot of those things translated even better than we had hoped for. But before we get into the episode, if you want to catch the audio version of this podcast, it's on Spotify and Apple Podcasts at The Gift News Podcast. It's also on YouTube where you'll see our video version where I can't wait to see the facial expressions and reactions from Steven because there's going to be some questions on here. But I think starting out, I got to say, how did it feel to make the playoffs? We're just going to cut everything off. I want to start right there for 2024. As Magic fans who have been following this team for such a long time, how did it feel to finally get back to that spot after some time with new people on your team, with new franchise players you can build around? How did that feel for you guys? Ryan, go ahead. Take it. Hey, I mean, it was huge. You know, like we didn't just like eke into the playoffs like a few years prior where we're creeping in as the eight seed or, or the six seed. Like we jumped right into that four or five matchup and two, three, eight was super close. So it kind of could have gone a lot of different directions at the end, but they pulled through. And like you said, we, we made it first time in years and with a whole new core that looks like they should be here for quite a long time. I mean, they're one of the top defenses in the league and just a super exciting style of play where we're playing modern basketball finally. I mean, especially once Coach Mosley came in and introduced kind of a drive and kick scheme and a hustle culture where playing through the whistle, never giving up on any game. And it's just been an exciting style of play ever since he got here. And it, it's cool to kind of see that continuity pay off through the development of all the young guys that have been brought in gradually and see like a clear core of like a, a handful of starting uh, you know, stars really up and coming stars and in, in Franz and Paulo, a handful of defensive anchors and Jalen Suggs and Jonathan Isaac, and then role players that just match this team first winning mentality of, of two way play with Wendell Carter, Anthony Black, and Markel Fultz before him last season. And, you know, it's just super exciting to finally get there. Yeah, just to like, you know, jump on top of that, like <clears throat> when you look at this era of Magic basketball being led, you know, last season, like Paulo was 21, Franz was 22. Um, and like you think about that compared to the last couple iterations of Magic teams that made the playoffs, you know, 10 years ago, we had, you know, 12 years ago, we had the Dwight era, which was like obviously amazing. That was a championship caliber team, made the finals. Um, Dwight was in MVP races and stuff like that. It was just like, you know, a really great time in Magic history. And then, you know, we didn't make the final or the playoffs again until 2019 with Nikola Vucevic, uh, Aaron, Evan Fournier and Aaron Gordon. And like as a Magic fan and like someone who covered the team that that time period was fun. Like, don't get me wrong, but we still knew like they were a first round exit team like unless some major roster changes happened that core didn't have a very high ceiling so then to like see this era of basketball come through and make the team being led by you know 21 22 year olds uh you know jalen suggs i think is like around like 21 as well um it's just like wendell carter like 25 They're, they were the third or fourth youngest team in the league um and they made the playoffs which was like really exciting and it just the energy with fandom um, and the understanding of where this team can really go felt so different. Uh, and you could feel it around the city too. 
I don't live in Orlando anymore. Mm. I'm very in depth and integrated into the community still. And you could just feel the energy being different and talked about with fans. Like my parents, for example, they're my dad's 70, my mom's like 68. Um, you know, they were aware that the magic made the playoffs, uh, back in the Vooch era, but like they were definitely more hyped and more tuned in during this era. Cause it's just like, you can just tell it's a different energy. Um, I was able to go to game six at the Kia center in Orlando. And it was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had as a magic fan going to that game. It was electric. Uh, one of the wildest experiences yeah, I've ever seen in that arena. And, um, yeah, man, it's this young team that's on the up and up to, so to see them make the playoffs this early into this era of, of players and to push a, a good Cavs teams to game seven was, was really exciting. Yeah, man, I gotta say, I think the magic showed a lot of people last year that their defense was legitimate. This wasn't just some one season thing where they had this run where teams maybe didn't expect them. They came into the season. Really people didn't know exactly how to feel. And I feel like the best part about their year is there wasn't some like massive superstar leap from Franz or Apollo. They had good years for sure. Right. But they didn't jump to like, Oh wow. He went from 15 to 25. Like this was a team effort all the way through, through and through. And for their defense to be that legitimate in the league with the leaps that we saw from key, key players, right? We talked all last year about the backcourt and who could pop and who couldn't or whatever. And to see Jalen Suggs have the season that he had on both ends of the basketball, you just saw this team continue to contribute to what their identity is. And it gave them a ton of success against the best of the best. Even in the playoffs, we saw how frightening that magic defense was. And just to know that this is a young team, I think it's great to see a super young team have their identity be on the defensive end of the ball. Obviously, offensively, you want the team to get better and take leaps, but to see them be so fundamentally sound and then add to that, which we'll get into the Magic offseason later, I was very happy to see that from this young Magic team in the first year with all their pieces coming together like this. I want to ask you guys next. What were you most impressed by from the players on this roster? I already mentioned a key player in Jalen Suggs, but are, are there any things that really stood out to you at the beginning of your season? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take this one first, if that's okay, Ryan. Um, I love their resilience this, this past year. They, um, they didn't let losses really affect them from going into the next game. Um, and even in like, like we saw less blowouts, we saw them compete through more four quarters than we had in previous seasons where a lot of younger teams like find that struggle. Um, and you know, they, they finally started to beat the teams that they were supposed to the below 500 teams, the teams not expecting to make the playoffs. And then we saw them start to get more and more, um, impressive wins, Versus teams that were playoff teams, you know, they beat the Denver Nuggets twice. They they beat the Celtics a couple times. Um, you know, they had a really incredible uh, win against the, um, the 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 Timberwolves and and you know beat the Lakers twice. Like they 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 beat a lot of really good teams out there. So it was like it was fun to see them start to prove themselves. But then when I really say resilience, like I remember looking back at specifically the San Antonio game or no, sorry, the Sacramento Kings game. Um, when Franz Wagner rolled his ankle, this was pretty early into the season, I think, uh, early January. Um, you know, at least I call that early. Um, and they, and Franz Wagner rolled his ankle. He was out for like, I think 15 to 20 games with that rolled ankle, uh, maybe 10, but like Paulo carried the team on his back. Franz rolled his ankle into four minutes into the game. The team was already rattled with injuries. There was already like Cole Anthony was a scratch on that game. Um, Anthony Black was sick and tried to play but ended up couldn't really playing with whatever yeah. illness he was dealing with he was pulled five minutes into the game didn't join back in they were playing two-way players um you know guys at the very end of the bench it was like a very injury riddled team at that point in time uh, wendell carter jr was out with a knee issue and so was markel Foles. it was just like there was no one available and you know they, they ended up losing but paulo had like a 40 point game may, maybe even a triple double that game um, and like they took, he took the team to, to double overtime 
Oh, this double is double OT game team. you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and like the Magic lost, which is okay, but they still had another game on that road trip before they got back to Orlando, right? This was a five game or six game road trip. And this was game four of that road trip. And then they still had to go to Denver, which is the, one of the hardest places to go play on a road trip. And also like at the end of a road trip when you're exhausted dealing with that altitude. And they pulled out a win with half their roster still missing, right? And Paolo was, was great yeah. in that game, too. Paolo was yeah. great that game. And so then they got it back home and continued to just stay on track and not go on this, like, massive losing streak, which they very easily could have and probably would have in past years. So just to kind of see them take that mental step, that mental growth of, um, you know, resilience to to fight through and not just kind of like crater mentally as as half the team is injured um and being on these long road trips and 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 sickness flowing through the through the roster it was like it's just really cool to see them like have that um yeah that was probably one of the biggest growth areas that i saw that's not like an individual player step but as like a team step and right. part of the reason like one of the biggest reasons they they made it to the fine like the playoffs and, and had a really good playoff series no doubt resilience resiliency resilient is a great way to describe this team and um I'd, I'd probably go with the word development especially the internal player development Mo most specifically last year probably Suggs and Paulo especially from three-point range we saw like Suggs development was probably the most noticeable because he went from one of the basically the worst impact rating in the league as a rookie to one of the best defenders in the league as a guard he, he made he was a, rated a top 10 defender, made the all-defensive second team, and it was a key part of the, the team's second overall defense where Orlando was one of the only top eight defenses that was not also ranked top 10 in defensive field goal percentage. They were only 13th in there. So kind of like OKC, they got the job done by forcing turnovers. They were second overall in turnover percentage and second overall in, in rebounding percentage on that end. Uh, but Suggs himself ranked top 10 in steals. I mean, there was, especially to start the season, he was just leading the league in deflections and, and steals and forcing turnovers, very noticeably improving on that end. And we already knew he was a good defender, but he, he took it up a notch there. And then the real improvement mm -hmm. came on the offensive end. Like he, the one thing he's been good at his whole career was his handoff efficiency, was his most efficient scoring play type. He's always been fairly good efficient wise he, he was 1.1 points per possession in year two and stayed 1.1 in year three but he saw his spot up his catch and shoot his pull up three point percentage all the off ball shooting rocketed up from like 30 percent pull ups 34 percent catch and shoot all the way to a 39 percent three point shooter on high volume so i i would compare the development to kind of like marcus smart where he, he was a little bit streaky early on and maybe lower percentage, but he kept he kept going at it, kept shooting, high volume, and now he's he might still be streaky, but he he's coming through with the higher percentage to back it up, and that's like a you know there there's a reason the haters are, are commenting on the spacing like that is a real concern for Orlando's offense because they they average high volume of drive and kicks, they a, a ton of patent sprays from their two tall forward scoring creators in Paulo and Franz. But someone's got to be out there to knock it down, and they can't be hesitant to let it fly around this team. So Suggs being able to hit those threes on and off the ball is huge. And I think that his decision-making also is, was good development, maybe not insane jump development, but just as a pick-and-roll creator, in, including his ISO efficiency, jumped up to 1.1 points per possession as well. But even though he, he might still force some, some tough twos every, every once in a while, He's become a much better playmaker, especially just reading the defenses, driving kicks. I think Suggs' development specifically has, is is the big outlier last season. And then Paulo also saw some gradual development as well, where he's now a, a high-volume, high-efficiency three-point shooter that he wasn't necessarily that early on in his career. So um, Wendell, when he was available, also saw pretty good development from, from downtown. But like Stephen mentioned, they – there was actually a lot of injuries this year. Like Wendell missed 27 games. Isaac missed 24 games. Fultz missed 39. Gary Harris missed yep. 28. And Franz and Suggs missed 10 and 7 apiece. So what we ended up seeing, even during the winning streaks, was Paulo carrying essentially the team's third stringers in the starting lineup for, for stretches. Like there, we had this huge winning streak at the beginning of the season where we lost all the starters and 
like halfway through, but we uh, the Magic still won the next like five games with Goga Bataze, Anthony Black, Caleb Houston, Chuma Okiki in the starting lineup because Paulo is this drive and kick, powerful downhill force who just creates good looks. And they were they were able to play team first ball, move the move the ball around, hit the open shots when it came to them, and it led to some high impact ratings for both the lineup and individually. So I would say that that development and also the roster versatility allowing them to step up and be the next man up while maintaining that chemistry in the second unit without having to break that second unit up because that was another really strong lineup by net rating. That that was really key for for the Magic last season. Yeah, there's so many areas where I was very impressed with their season. Um, I want to give you the specific defensive numbers. Um, the Magic finished the season number two in the NBA defensively in points per possession, 111.5. Like, that's just insane when you consider the injuries that this roster still had. Um, I also do have to point out, we spent 30 minutes last year. Jonathan Isaac, when he got the minutes, was damn near like the best defender in the league in terms of his impact um a lot of great moments from him but i gotta say for me my favorite stretch of the magic season was probably that that super early stretch at the time boston looked like a very dominant team you go into boston blow them out basically and it was like a great well-rounded game from franz and paolo um seeing paolo get better at passing the ball rebounding and just doing things a bit more consistent especially when he had to floor raise a depleted roster it just showed you like the growth in his game more i feel like a lot of people don't really speak about paulo when he's like a number one pick that had a pretty good first year so to see him come out on fire this year as well was a good thing um jalen sucks to me he made the season I think for him to make that development where he was a 40% three-point shooter, good volume, very good defense, and he was like also making good pass, I felt like you saw the most complete version of Jalen Suggs, and it answered the question so fast because we spent so much time on, okay, how does his backcourt look with this, that, this, that, and to see Jalen Suggs take the lead, this is everything I feel like Magic fans really could have asked for, and I think that this gives you a great, tone guy because most guys in the NBA at the point guard spot are not defensive specialists they're offensive guys who can be neutrals or just pretty bad right on defense Jalen Suggs is the flip of that and I think that that's at the tone when you have so many guys that are not weak links on the defensive end so for me that was the highlight of the season and those are the two players I was the most intrigued by also I want to throw in a bit of bias here. Jet Howard is a guy I'm really looking at. I'm going to leave that there. I like his game a lot. Hope to see him get some minutes yeah. next year. I mean, they, they get up. Jet. Yeah, I mean, he, he's an exciting electric scorer. Brings a little midi pull-up game. That, that could be a dynamic scorer, shoot, three-point shooting option off the bench. And, I mean, you hit on the head with Suggs. Like, he was a top-five pick, and that comes with a lot of expectations that you're going to be a, a, a star or at least some sort of high offensive scoring option. And we're hoping, as fans, that he, he's kind of found his role as, as and can kind of grow out of that role as a defensive ace. He can lock up point of attack. He can switch essentially one through four in a, in a lot of cases. And he can be kind of an offensive, versatile, um, you know, just bring a lot of different options offensively where he can play a, a lot of different roles, especially off the ball as kind of a secondary creator off the front court primary creator. Yeah, I mean, like, Suggs, you know, he, not not enough good things to say about him. You know, he started to conti he continue to develop as a playmaker. Um, it's, you know, he had his career assist numbers last year as being one of the, or actually, no, I lied on that. Um, he did not have a career assist. That was his rookie season. But, like, he, de he, he developed better as a playmaker. He had uh, some of his lowest turnovers to assist ratio uh, as a player last year in general, which was really nice. But, you know, obviously, like, the shooting's going to jump out and his defense is going to jump out. You know, going from, I have the numbers right here, you know, his rookie year 21% three-point shooter on three attempts per game or uh, uh, four attempts per game 
32% his sophomore year at four attempts per game. And then last year he jumped to 39% on five attempts per game. And what's cool about that is if you watch his shots and if you watch how he takes his shots, where he takes his shots, the mechanics behind it. I'm not a shot doctor, so I can't tell you like this is the perfect form, but I can tell you it doesn't look weird. Um, there's nothing about his shot, his shooting from last year that doesn't feel like it's going to be sustainable. Now, is he always going to be shooting 39%? I'm not sure. Like maybe he lands more at like a 37, 38%, but like that's some really impressive jumps right there for a, for a young man who, um, you know, struggled early and continued to take steps every year and increased his volume last year, which is really nice in that department. And then of course, like, you know, like in my opinion, the average defender is not fun to watch. But you watch Jalen Suggs and you're like, oh, this is entertaining. Like he's a fun It's guy. fun to watch him get to it. Yeah. Yeah, excuse my language. I don't know if I can say that on here or not. I'll try not to, but like he's <laughs> yes, a you can. dog, man. And like he just goes after players. He tries a hundred percent on every possession. He's so good at fighting over screens to just really hassle the ball handler. Um, and you know, like yeah, we can give credit to Jonathan Isaac, gifted defender, but the reason why this team was a top two defensive team all season, and I believe uh, RK, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we were like number one since the All-Star break defensively, that, you know, it, it's because of Jalen Suggs, and then you got, you know, this 6'10 wing Franz Wagner, like right there to pick up switches too, who's a very capable defender. So like, just shout out to Jalen Suggs, like, it's going to be really cool to see him develop even more next year. Like they didn't go trade for a traditional point guard. They didn't make a swing and, and go sign Tyus Jones and, and they didn't bring back Markel Fultz. And, and that's because they are going to continue to believe that Jalen Suggs will continue to evolve his game in that develop in that department. And as well, taking a bet on Anthony black and Cole Anthony continue to be better playmakers for this team but also like it's just trusting that Jalen Suggs when the ball is in his hand is going to make good decisions with it and he overall did last year yes the offense struggled at times when it got stagnant and a you know if you had a Darius Garland on this team or Tyus Jones they would have been able to help unlock some things but like you know he will get better there and so will Paulo and so will Franz who will also get better as playmakers. Um, but, but yeah, like really high on Jalen Suggs. Someone mentioned it earlier before we started recording, he's going to get an extension. Um, it's not uncommon for the magic not to have all their guys extended this early. They extended Franz pretty early cause he was going into the Olympics. Um, but Franz, it maybe it's handled like Cole Anthony where he was signed his extension literally days before the deadline. Um, mm -hmm. so I do expect him to, to be on a nice little four or five year extension coming up here in another month or two. All right. Suggs is defense is it's next level. Uh, some extra stats in there for you. He rated 11th in defensive EPM, the impact rating on dunks and threes.com, the fifth best guard rating finished fifth, 15th in total deflections and top 30 in deflections per 36 and deflections per game. One of the leaders in steals and just clearly one of the elite defenders to anchor this defense for, for years to come. And, and you mentioned Franz Wagner, who's almost an underrated defender at this point because he, he's really one of the best two-way wings in the league and especially the Eastern Conference. He himself was ranked 21st in defensive VPM, tied with Kawhi and Amen Thompson and as far as that goes and tied for 31st in overall EPM with Jamal Murray just ahead of Chet Holmgren. So clearly a rising star and and both also had like key games, especially in the playoffs where I'm sure we'll get to it, but like game four, Franz stepped up with a 34 point game, really showing off his point forward capability as a creator in that series and, and showing what he can be as a, a passer on a big stage. And Suggs had himself a huge game in the, the first home game. He made team history as uh, the third most points of any Magic player in their home deb debut tied with Shaq with 24 points. And, it, and it's just one game, but, like, you know, anytime you tie Shaq, it, it's, it's worth mentioning. Man, that is... <laughs> I find that so crazy, man. I just, I just... I think they needed a season like this, too, because we talked about it, right? Like, there's moves that they could have made. They could have got some, like, fancy point guard, all this and all that. But I think with the new CBA, player development is at a premium, a premium. Because if you go out there and you sign a guy that doesn't fit and you'll 
have to overpay them or whatever, it really eats up into what your overall resources are. And I feel like internal development, especially with the contracts that these players have, it just makes a ton of sense to really focus on that lane and the avenue and to really build around the margins. I think the KCP acquisition is a great one because it further feeds into that, right? Adding another good two-way guy who has value, who's won before, right? To give good guidance to that, you know, team, but also be a valuable player on the floor to add to your defensive scheme. This is a year where they could have the best defense in the NBA confidently for the entire season. I can see that. No doubt. I mean, they had basically are running back the second best defense and made an upgrade over Gary Harris with KCP where it's a similar role. He's a better defender right away and a more versatile scorer and still brings that catch and shoot three point threat as well, where, um, you know, the, there was some rumors that they might be chasing Hartenstein as well as another big free agent uh, this off season. And, you know, Orlando decided to kind of run it back and bring back a versatile group of centers that gives them some roster versatility that can help, you know, play different matchups, different nights with Goga Bataze, more of a traditional post-up presence and still a high-impact defender like Hartenstein. Bring back Mo Wagner, more of an offensive pick-and-roll threat who can pop for three. They kept Wendell instead of potentially trading him, who who had probably an off, a, an off year relative to where he was before, but... He, yeah. was, he was also hurt, and he was kind of, same with Fultz. They were both hurt, and I don't know if they ever fully recovered from that in terms of just finding their rhythm. But you know, if you're going over a three-year sample size of what Wendell has done here, he, he has proven pick and roll chemistry, strong screener, smart player on both ends, brings effort, and he might not be an elite shot blocker, but he he is a smart team defender who knows where to be, and just really is a cerebral player on both ends. So like. You, you give Orlando's roster and their coaches all those different options for different nights, depending on the matchup. You have Paulo there, so you can kind of play with different, um, see who fits with Paulo on different nights, see who's hot, see who's bringing the effort that night the most. And it, it's not, not the worst thing to have all those options, even if you're not going after that, that one high-impact defender like Hartenstein. So we'll see kind of how that works out. I think he's a great fit for OKC and worthy of the investment there because they loaded up with Caruso and Hartenstein on top of their sure elite did. defense. So like that, that's going to be another you know elite defense to to deal with. But Orlando like coming running basically running back the second best defense while adding an elite point of attack defender who who is known for spreading the floor. I mean addressing a need. And to me, it's basically a Gary Harris upgrade for this starting rotation while also mm-hmm. keeping Gary for the road for the backup role where they're not having to play maybe Fultz who is not much of a shooter or a, a random guard of the night now they kind of know they can trust the second unit as well and they, they have multiple options of just strong defensive guards who don't hurt you who can make an open pass an open three and and keep the ball moving with a dribble drive between Suggs KCP Anthony Black and Gary Harris, and you know, we'll we'll see how Chet Howard breaks in that mix as well, especially as more of an offensive option. But he, he should bring a dynamic scoring option with with a cool midi game. So a lot a lot of lot to like, especially in uh, the guard rotation and the player development, like you mentioned. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off that too. You know, like this second unit is not like. It was already pretty good last year, but it's it's only gotten better this year, right? They they got mm. rid of guys in the rotation that were not going to be super effective anymore. You know, Markel Fultz, he got demoted to the second unit as a, from a starter. Granted, yeah, he was some injured, but there was also questions if he was going to fit like like system wise going forward. So a sad, you know, great player for the Magic, like beloved. Um, you know, did a lot of really awesome things for the community. Was constantly like voted like one of like teammates of the year so he was like just a really good guy in general but his fit was no was starting to become obvious that it wasn't going to work and like he was an okay defender last year but it definitely was a decline from where he was at the year before so when you replace that with guys like gary harris who on a smaller role like not playing and not being asked to play 28 30 minutes a night playing in that great fit where he can, yeah like hopefully he'll be able to stay a little bit healthier there but he is a He's a much better primary defender than than, uh, Markel Fultz was, in my opinion. Um, And then you got young Anthony Black, who's like a 6'7 guard. 
uh, with I think like a six eleven wingspan or something ridiculous like that, or six. He's going to be a very good defender. Insane. And he's all, and he like he's getting stronger. He's been in the gym all summer. Um, he's hardly left Orlando at all. He's just been constantly in the gym, working out with the trainers and the staff. He's basically since the season end. That's the most consistent face you have seen the Orlando Magic post when they post gym photos throughout the off season. It's 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 Anthony Black and extremely gifted defender. Yes, his offense has some questions, but his defense is already a very good defender for the NBA after like a rookie season. So um, that's that's going to be amazing. And then you got another year of Jonathan Isaac in that second unit who uh, might get more minutes. He's he should. I mean, this is his first healthy off season, like legit in ages. This is he's not recovering right. from something where last season he had a minor surgery at the very end of the season to clean some stuff up, I think in his knee um, and his meniscus, I believe it was. And then, uh, it didn't hold him out forever, but it was like four or five weeks of recovery from that. And but but like now, healthy uh, healthy full season knows a lot more about his game after playing a full season. Coming in healthy into this off season, so far no reports that he's had any setbacks or any injuries. So like I expect that going into training camp. And like, dude, you know they're just gonna be a menace in that second unit too. Um, Cole Anthony, he's short, but he he tries on defense. He doesn't like often give up on plays, which is cool. It's not always effective. Like there's guys with height that can give him troubles, but like he's not a negative necessarily on the defensive end. Um, so it's gonna be fun to see, like. Yes, we're all excited to see KCP and Suggs just like wreck havoc. You <laughs> That's gonna be two fun. Guys that are yeah. both capable of making like second team all defensive team. Um, and then right next to them, if they have to switch, oh cool, six ten small forward Franz Wagner, very very capable perimeter defender. Like, um, so it's like it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be fun defensively. And you know, someone earlier said top ten defense. Well, we were second in defense last year. Like, I'm pretty sure they're gonna be. A top three defense this year again. That's a lot to me. So like, yeah, yeah. They're gonna defense translates, the you know, out of people, especially the yeah. just a, the way uh, defense just translates. Especially when you bring back the same players, same schemes, same expectation for effort. It's like, the continuity piece, right? Like, like yeah. I love this Magic team so much because they have their culture right translating from the starters to their bench right they don't have weaker defenders as much coming off like they have a clear identity from the starters and the bench in terms of how we want to go out there and with basketball games and it's through harassing people right it's through getting in the passing lanes it's through getting good shots in transition i think that's going to be a huge part of their game i like jet howard so much because he's a dynamic athlete he has a great quick first step and if he can reach into that shot Shot, a off the dribble shooter on the magic who like bro you just add so many more levels of dynamicism you know what i'm saying like he can be a great fit into what everything else they have like having a guy like that off your bench and then great point that steven made that people do not pay attention to players getting injured during the offseason hurts because you don't have time to try to get better you're trying to heal up and get yourself back on the floor and then there's a rehab process and then there's also the mental hurdle where the entire season i was hurt basically so like this whole off season i couldn't really get myself better now that he had an entire off season to work and train now he can actually say okay what other areas can i get better at can i become a more consistent three-point guy can i become a more consistent closeout guy can my passes off the catch be better right like it's those small details that players sometimes don't have the access to get better at because they're trying to recover this is the first real offseason where a lot of these players get a chance to just work on their game and not have to recover from something. So I love that point, Steven. That just adds to the continuity piece even more to me. And some fun facts for that second unit as well. Like Isaac Cole and Mo Wagner had the 23rd highest net rating of any three-man combo with 500 minutes last year. And a little underrated thing about Gary Harris is last year his, his three-point percentage dipped for him to 39%. The year before, he was one of the best catch and shoot shooters in the league, forty-five percent from three. If you if you look at a three-year sample, he has the same three-year sample three-point percentage as Clay Thompson over the last three years, albeit 
on about half the volume, about four and a half threes compared to Clay taking nine threes a game. So, you know, you, you might have wanted to trade for, for Clay for, for that spacing, but, but Gary technically hits the same rate percentage wise, and now he'll be on the second unit, not asked to do as much. So, you know, that's just some good signs for, for that chemistry between those four yeah. going forward. And then Isaac himself, like you mentioned, like uh, a random fun fact about him, he's been here for seven seasons in Orlando. In the three years where he's played 46% of the games, just about half of the games, they've made the playoffs all three years. He, mm. he was first in the whole league in defensive EPM, one notch ahead of Hartenstein, that, that rumored free agent. And if you look at overall EPM, that defense carries it, but he's tied with Tyrese Maxey at, at 29th overall. And if you throw in some like blocks and deflection stats, Goga is really high too. In blocks per minute, Isaac was eighth, Goga was ninth among players with 500 minutes. And in uh, deflections, uh, they Isaac was tied for 41st in deflections for 36 with players that had over 500 minutes and he was tied with like Paul George, Donovan Mitchell, Jokic and Jaron Jackson Jr. So clearly like he might not be playing starter minutes, but he's finally, he, he's in a nice role for himself that really lets him do what he does best. He's not asked to do too much. He's there's not too much of a minute load on a night to night where you're risking injury or you're running him like running him into the ground. He comes in at the moment in, in a clean role where he can anchor the second unit. The rest of the second unit brings a lot of offensive creation between Cole and formerly Ingles running pick and roll with Mo Wagner. So we hope to see maybe De Silva step up in a little bit of that Ingles role. We'll see how, mm. what kind of opportunity he gets there. But, you know, that, that floor balance is really key. And then, you know, normally opposing teams are used to getting a break when the second unit comes in where the defense isn't as intense. And here comes Jonathan Isaac clocking He just in maintains. After. Yeah, just like, you know, the, it's the last player they want to see when they think they, they might get a break against second units. And Isaac's also one of the most versatile defenders in the league. So you, you have him as an anchor of the second unit who can also close, who can also probably lock down just about, you know, anyone, uh, save for a handful of superstar wings maybe. But, you know, Isaac's been able to show he can lock down basically one through five. And there's really not many players that can actually, you know, show they can lock down Kristaps Porzingis on one end and uh, Darius Garland or, or something on the other end of the lineup. Like, there's only so many with that speed, that agility, that length, and that IQ to just be able to to move around on defense and just a super malleable defensive option for, for the Magic. And it's nice that he mm -hmm. is not asked to be a priority offensively, which gives him a little room to grow. And like you said, hopefully this summer, maybe develop just, just a handful of things. Like, he's always flashed a little, like, fake – corner catch and shoot three into the one dribble elbow pull up like just really just fine tuning some of those ancillary skills around what he already brings would go a long way and and help help his two-way impact and playing time and you know we'll we'll see if if he is like he's obviously good enough to deserve more opportunity and it just depends on kind of where the front office and the coaches view his yep. um like the injury risk for how, how much they actually want to play him and if it's better to kind of just keep him as a secondary option off the bench and use him when needed, like maybe on a night where they really need his defense to, to slow down a Paul George on the other end, then you throw him out there to close or something. And otherwise, just kind of keep him in the reserves, keep him on ice so he's, he's fresh every time he, he comes out there. I need people to remember, by the way, could you say Paul George? I just need people to remember. I understand Paul George hit the shot, but if you saw the contest, if you saw what he was doing to Paul George the entire time he was in the game, to Steven's point, it can get very wicked. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just to j carry back on what Ryan was saying real quick, you know, just keep it short on Jonathan Isaac. Like, Last year, he played more back-to-backs than he had ever played in a very long time. Um, and they did close games with him. So um, it, his role is only going to expand next year. It's it's it, It'll probably be a second-unit role um, unless, like, Wendell is just not cutting it. But, like, they'll mix in lineups with him playing with the starters. You know, oftentimes when he was playing, they would he would be one of the first two people off the bench to go in and play next to that starting unit. And then... Towards the second half of the year, we started seeing him close games, which is really exciting as his minutes continued to increase up until his, you know, where he was 
hitting around 18 to 20 minutes per game towards the second half of the season, which was really cool. So, um, yeah, man, he's he's going to be a big part of this team. They just gave him a really cool extension. Um, well, it's actually a renegotiated extension. I'll explain it real quick. So, basically what they did is they restructured his current deal and extended it for another four years. So, this year it's front-loaded with $25 million, taking about 17 percent of the cap space and then the following three years it dro- or four, four years it drops to about uh 15 million 14 million and four yeah basically 15 million for the for the rest of the four years through 2028 20, 29 um but what's cool we all know he's a player that's constantly injured there's some really nice injury preventions or uh, uh, oh. uh exceptions on there um for example uh 2026 20, 27 is only partially guaranteed with 8 million but that's because he has to play 52 games at least the previous season 2025 2026 um and then that continues that 52 games played mark for the previous season is what's going to guarantee him money the following two years which are both fully non-guaranteed so if he like really hurts himself in another season or two they have an easy way out which is very nice for uh jonathan isaac and his mixed history of health so and I need people to understand played. the cap gymnastics that the Magic are doing with this. Any contract for a player that the last time he played over 60 games, or maybe close to it, right? He was a fringe DPOY guy. The fact that he he is on a contract under a new CBA that is front-loaded, that has games played measures, that's just a great contract. That could in two years, he, he could have the most like valuable contract in terms of like wing types in the league that's a great contract steve this is yeah, team exactly. friendly as it comes no doubt i mean the the magic yeah. have this uncanny ability to to get team friendly deals with front loaded options and descending years and descending values and last year was actually the first season isaac's played over half a half of the season since 2019 so like that's for him to meet that 52 game mark will actually be something of a challenge because more often than not he doesn't so that you hope to see just some consistency just to play just as much as he did last year and just kind of continue to be available because orlando really covered their bases where like if something happens worst comes to worse it's not going to hurt them and it's really not not even that bad of a contract even without the provisions in terms of just the salary i mean you're like you said you're talking about essentially a role player contract value with deep boy level impact when he's actually on the court and you know if, if you actually get that full time or even three-fourths of the time it, it's one of the best value deals in the league after this year it's going to be less than 10 percent of the cap uh total team cap elite and then those last couple of years will be seven percent so it's it's nice and like i just have to make a big of point of this because a lot of teams like do not understand like how to take advantage of the cap, right? Like there's many restrictions. Obviously, if you go over both of the aprons, you're kind of locked in. You can't aggregate contracts or whatever. But to get a contract under that pillar with his improvements, as RK just told you, like that speaks to what they can do for the magic of the team, period, if he can be a viable player. Because now it's like, okay, well, we have more cat to play with. Let's go get more spacing. Let's go get more guys who fit into our defensive and our offensive identity. That's a great fit still. All right. And Orlando had just plenty of cap room to spend this summer. Maybe they got a sign early on that Paul George wasn't coming here. So they, they went ahead and made their move with KCP before that even became official. And – From there, they basically paid all of their guys and made everyone happy and retained the the core and the roster that got them there on on just one team friendly contract after another. Like they're they're all relatively low percentage of the caps, save for Franz and Paulo who got max deals. Everyone else is between like ten or fifteen, maybe eighteen million per year. They're pretty much flat or descending. The that that just gets a lower percentage as the years go on. So Orlando was able to use up the salary room they had this year and create value going forward as the cap goes up and the contracts go down. And it's just great, you know, salary management by the front office in that sense. And even the guys that they brought back, you know, outside of just having great numbers attached to them, it's like, you know, uh, 
Gary Harris team option on the second year, Mo Wagner team option on the second year, <laughs> Goga team option on the third year. Um, even a uh, Caldwell Pope player option on the third year, which is, is fine. But like, even that contract is like, no one's going to blink. Like Caldwell Pope is, is easily worth that contract. Right. Um, and none of these are too long to where they're like hard to trade. Um, right. you know, if the team did need to make a trade, like no one's going to sniff an eye at, at, you know, if next season, you know, there, yeah, there's Caldwell Pope's being traded from the magic i don't expect that but like hypothetically speaking you know it's like no people don't teams don't get scared on two-year contracts anymore you know and, and he's so, the one piece he's, away he's twip. type yeah. of trade that you might see to that point totally i'm i'm actually happy that we got back to kcp because i did want to specifically dive into what his value will be and i just think that a guy that shot 45 percent from three right on good good enough volume on a team like this i think he has so much value because you finally have a real movement shooter off the ball right where he can do do so many things paulo like turning paulo into a big who can be more dho based at times with KCP and what that opens up for everyone with Franz as an active guy who, who can be athletic at the rim too. It just opens up more driving lanes and more opportunities to make your offense better, especially if your corner shooters really improve. I just like what he has there. And then defensively, he's one of the best chasers in the league, right? Like he's very good at that. And you have a stable back line to help support him as well. I just think there's so much value he can add. What do you guys think is the biggest impact Casey will bring day one on this Magic team? Man, like, I, I, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll take this one real quick and then I'll let you jump in there. But, like, this isn't even something that's on the box score. It's on his fingers. He's got two championships as a starting shooting guard, right? Yeah. Like, the Magic haven't had a, had a player on uh, on the roster that has won a championship in a ages i can't honestly remember the last time they've had a player that has a ring and now we have a guy who wasn't just like the 14th man or the 13th man on the bench he was the starting shooting guard for the los angeles lakers in 2019 when they won the championship and then uh two years ago with the denver nuggets so very important person someone who um you know nuggets fans talked a lot about this about how he was such a core piece to their culture their team identity um you know we got a guy in the comments right now saying like he misses them on the lakers and that we're gonna love him here like you can just tell like he's not a bullshit kind of guy he's gonna come in he's not afraid to do the work he's not afraid to you know i don't think he's gonna be afraid to put a player in his place if they're not acting right which i don't expect this is a very high character group of players that wants to play hard and put in the work um but i think that experience is just going to be really invaluable to this magic roster and then when you think about like him upgrading over gary harris and i'm sure ryan will be able to give you the numbers here as as he you know follows up with this but it's like he's a better off ball mover mover than gary harris who is more of a static catch and shoot player he's not like a crate he's not like a jj reddick type off ball mover but he definitely moves well off ball um you know he can he he makes smart cuts and drives to the basket um he can handle the ball a little bit like like he's not going to be a primary ball handler but we don't need him to do that um, right you know and the thing about him and gary is like they both shoot about the same volume and the same consistency right right around four or five attempts per game right around 39 to 40 percent per game but the difference is caldwell pope makes shots in big moments gary harris does that inconsistently right he has had some but he's also had plenty of games in big moments where he just was a shell of himself like game seven in the nba uh first round uh series versus the celtics right um where i don't have those same types of worries with caldwell pope he's a much more consistent um like shooter even though they have very similar uh percentages in that area so um, and then like defensively, I don't, we, we've already talked about it, but he's just going to be a, he's going to be a menace next to Jalen Suggs. And it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. So like leadership, not someone who's like old and broken, like he's 31, um, you know, still a very high level defender and a, and, and someone who's going to help the 
the the spacing. He's a more respected shooter than Gary Harris. He's going to affect the spacing in that starting unit. And then, all oh, cool, someone who likes to talk trash about the spacing in the chat. We just moved our starting shooting guard in Gary Harris to the second unit. So yes, we didn't go get that like eight point or that eight attempt per game volume shooter, nine attempt per game yeah. volume shooter. But we added two four to five attempt per games, 40% shooters to the first and second unit. So it's like, that's pretty good. Oh yeah, we also drafted Tristan De Silva, who I'm sure we'll get to at some point, who's a 39% shooter the last two years in college. So it's like, the, the shooting is maybe not going to be a top 10 spacing league in the team, but they should definitely be a lot more respectable and at least league average in that department. So, all right, Gary Harris, I'm fucking hyped. Uh, Ryan, I'll pass <laughs> you now. <laughs> No doubt. I mean, you hit on all the big points. And I'd add one other factor as well that's huge with KCP is he's played 95% of his games since entering the league in 2014. Yes. I mean, 800. Durability. Yeah, for real. I mean, just that availability, durability, reliability, consistency after dealing with, with guards that just can be, you know, you, you might lose them for 20 game stretches. I mean, he's, he's played 835 out of 881 possible games in, a, in over a decade of being in the NBA. And, you know, like you said, brings that championship experience. He, in my opinion, he was the third best free agent even available. And he was one of only six free agents with championship experience. And I believe he was the only one to actually change teams. Everyone else stayed with their own players. So Orlando added, yep. coming from the second best defense, added one of the best point of attack defenders in the league and didn't give up anything to do it. And to your point earlier, he, he's shown a lot of development as – in his scoring versatility, not as especially in Denver. It, now, Jokic is obviously unique. He's one of a kind. But some of the similarities are that Jokic and Paulo both play out of the elbow, the high post. So if, they, if they're already running a lot of DHOs and pick and rolls from, from that setting, KCP should slide right into what Orlando already does. Absolutely. And he's shown high efficiency in DHOs, pick and rolls, and a little bit of more scoring versatility than, say, you know, the, the not to keep tearing down Gary Harris, but just slightly more versatile and slightly higher impact in the areas of need for this team. And, you know, Gary's able to do more in a smaller role now, and KCP was the absolute perfect answer for that Denver team to elevate their starting lineup to a championship contender where no one really thought much of giving up Ish Smith and Monte Morris and I think Will Barton. Nope was a part of that trade. And then, you know, all of a sudden KCP just slides in and makes that lineup perfectly balanced with his D and three role player. He's not trying to do too much. He's not asked to do too much. He just slides right in as a play finisher. And that he ideally does a lot of the same here in Orlando and is one more sign. Like we said earlier that Suggs might be getting more of that, those playmaking duties. When, when you lose a point guard and Fultz, you add a play finisher D and three guy in KCP and may, and keep Gary, then somebody's got a wrong point. So Suggs should yeah. probably be that guy who's just given more opportunities. And obviously it's still going through <clears throat> Paulo and Franz first, but you know, you still need somebody to set them up and you know, that, that should allow that to happen. And uh, one last stat is that KCP's defensive VPM is tied with D Aaron, D Aaron Fox and D Anthony Melton at 1.4, just about Drew Holiday's, who, who was at 1.3 in terms of defensive EPM rating. So just a, a super high defender, high volume, high efficiency, catch and shoot three point guy. And he brings a little bit of off the dribble juice that, that you might not see in the average DN3 role player. So just just yeah. about the perfect fit for the in terms of a free agent acquisition that this team could have added to the starting lineup. Save for kind of what we hope Jed Howard and you touched on earlier is like that that on the off the dribble pick and roll three point shooter someone who the defense cannot duck under the screens and cannot leave open that would really p potentially open up the floor for everyone else. Yes, so if you're not going to go out and trade for like Anthony Simons or you know Damian Lillard, obviously is, is not available, but that kind of player. If you're not going to go get that level star, then you know, finding another off-ball three-point threat and hoping that maybe Suggs or Jed Howard develops a little more off the dribble in that way is another way to go. And, you know, as, as long as Paolo and Franz are creating the drive and kick opportunities from three, there's going to be open threes for somebody. So we just got to start knocking them down. 
Yeah. The last thing I want to say about KCP before we transition to your young guys, Franz, and then like the Eastern Conference, the last thing that I have to note here is KCP to me is the piece that made Denver the best starting five in basketball. Sure. I think mainly because the two way ability he gave them. But also, if you watch this Denver team in the playoffs, in the nine Jokic minutes, KCP had many big games where he was carrying their offense at times, right? Just because of his natural shot making gift. Now, this postseason, he didn't play as great, fine, but he never had a team where defensively, a lot of guys could be counted on at a high level outside of his Lakers stops, right? Those are big teams. But this Magic team has it to where they're young, they get after it, they get up and down the floor, and they have a championship guy to really pick his brain on, on how to you know, train, how to take care of your body, how to be durable, right? Those are the intangibles you don't see people talk about. But he can also hoop and play basketball. This isn't some broken down guy you're getting. This is a guy that just came off a season where he, he was one of the best defenders in the NBA. And he was a consistent shooter for the entire season. So I like that for this team. But you talked about it earlier. I want Steven to let me know how excited he is about the Magic's young players and what their future and their role could potentially be even in this overall season. I think there's a couple interesting guys there for sure. Yeah, um, you know, this when you say young players, it's like hard not to include 75% of the team, but I'll stick it <laughs> the actual young players um, yeah. that, that don't get talked about often. Anthony Black, Jet Howard, um, and our rookie Tristan De Silva this year. You know, starting with Tristan De Silva, you know, Four year rookie out of college, uh, played out of played Colorado. Um, you know, I think he's like six nine or something like that, or six eight. Um, you know, pretty big size forward who can shoot the ball, um, makes smart passes, and a, and a solid defender. He was talked about as having one of the highest IQs out of the entire draft class. Um, and I think why he wasn't higher on people's draft boards was because of his age. Age really gets a lot of people. Um, and he played four years, so he comes in as a rookie as a 23-year-old. So, um, But with all that being said, he's 23. He spent four years in college. His floor of a player... For, his floor as a player is much higher than a 19 year old rookie because he's already got so much experience. He already knows where to be in the court defensively in different sets. He already knows where to be offensively in different sets because his teams have played different types of basketball over the past four years. Right. And he's trained with multiple different people over the different off seasons over the past four years since he's been, you know, through college and now entering the NBA. And you saw that right away in summer league, right? He came in, immediately hit an impact like made an impact on that roster like when the ball was in his hands he'd make a smart pass with it he never really held on to it too long um and he didn't really turn the ball over too often when he was passing to different teammates and then like when he was playing off ball he was constantly moving right there'd be often times where you'd see him in the paint then he'd jet to the corner catch uh get the ball passed to him and take the open three and make the open three um mm -hmm. just just which is again like a lot of the shooting that we've had on the Magic the last couple of years haven't been off movement. So when you have a player like Tristan Da Silva, who's already got some of that built into his mental makeup of a player, like it's going to help unlock more of a motion offense for the Magic. Um, you know, whether he's in the second unit or you know whenever he's getting his minutes. Um, but he's a player that can come in. If he's in the rotation day one, you probably don't have to worry about him too, too much, right? He's going to be okay, um, which is really, really nice. And, like, yeah, he's not, like, a crazy defender. You probably can't switch him onto fives, um, and you probably can't switch him onto, like, small guards that are really quick, but he'll handle his own on, on the wings and the forwards. He'll be just fine there, which is really cool. Um, and, you know, then we hop down to Anthony Black. He already proved himself to be a menace on the defensive end last year as a rookie. Um, and his offense needs some work. There's no denying that, right? He still doesn't, he didn't really have a lot of ball handling, playmaking responsibilities when he was in the second unit last year. Um, and even as a starter, oftentimes when he was on the court, he'd bring it up and then immediately pass it to someone else to initiate the offense, which is okay. He was a rookie. They really like to, with their development plan, like, put guys in specific roles when you get to that when you get good at that role they'll expand it right and that's kind of what they were doing with him last year we'll see his role expand this year more 
again, part of the reason why they didn't bring back Mark Hall Fultz is a bet on Anthony Black to continue to develop. Um, what was cool, though, was like last year, he shot around 39, 40% from three. Very low volume. It was like mm-hmm. about one a game. But he was a willing shooter, um, and that was really nice to see him hit those at a pretty reasonable clip. My goal for him this year, maintain that defense as he's gotten stronger over the offseason. Um, he's going to be stronger physically, more built to handle more of a defensive load there. Um, but then also, you know, continue to evolve his offensive game, be a little bit more of a confident ball handler and creator for the rest of the team. And let's see if he can continue to, like, take up that three point per, like those three point attempts up to like three or four a game i'm not gonna ask for like right. six a game i think that's unreasonable but to go from one to like three to four i think is a higher volume request yeah let's increase that yeah. volume a bit um and then just continue to look for opportunities to cut to the basket and you know uh catch passes for you know you know layups or dunk attempts or whatever the case may be just be a willing cutter so that's kind of my thought on him Chad Howard, um, you know, he's he's going to be fun. He's a shooter. He, he is not it's a my guy. The ball fly. I don't think I've seen anyone on the Magic roster, maybe Caleb Houston, who's also got a ridiculously fast release, but the ball's in his hands, and then it's out of his hands very, very quick because he's got a very fast release. Um, he can handle the ball a little bit, too. He's got a little bit of a pull-up game. Um, he can step back. It's, it's going to be fun. I think the biggest reason we didn't see him um, with the Magic much, much last year is just where was he going to play? He would have sat on the bench most games um, yep. and not sniffed the floor unless there was a blowout. The Magic didn't have as many blowouts last year, which is really cool. Um, so what they did with him was they sent him to the G League where he can play. I think he played like 50, 40, 50 games for them. And he played, you know, 28 to 35 minutes per game, just getting those reps in as a ball handler, um, as a playmate, or not necessarily a playmaker, but, you know, getting the ball in his hands more and working on his defense, which was a criticism of his coming out of college. So, um, you know, we didn't sign a three-point volume shooter, but we might have already had one on our roster who is not going to be afraid to let them um, fly. So the question is, where do they fit in that lineup? Um, it's going to be tough right now. I have the second unit. Um, it's, it's, it, we'll see how it plays out, but you know, you got Cole Anthony, you got Gary Harris at the one and two. Um, you're going to have Jonathan Isaac and Mo Wagner at the four and five. So it's really that three spot. That's kind of a little bit up for debate, but it could be Anthony black. It could be Tristan De Silva. Um, and it also potentially could be jet. We'll just kind of see, but Regardless, the NBA season is a long one. There's going to be opportunity for these guys to get on the court. This team will have some injuries from time to time that will give multiple players different opportunities to get in and showcase themselves. Um, Very excited about all of those guys. Um, None of them are perfect players, but I think they all offer things that this team needs and will utilize at times. No doubt. And, you know, uh, great point about Jet. Like, I, I think the opportunity for him to get reps as the primary in the G League was probably more beneficial to his development than, like you said, like maybe one, three a game and very sporadic low minutes on the actual NBA team this past season. And, yeah, I mean, you, we might even see we'll, – we'll see kind of where Gary ends up. Like, he, he probably earned that right as the backup shooting guard, and there's a chance that Jet or Black just kind of overtake that spot because they're better at this point. But it's kind of up in the air until the actual season plays out. Um, but, you know, Jet, Jet brings a lot of offensive potential that is really exciting. Like you said, we didn't trade for a guy that that high volume shooter, but maybe he's that off the dribble, pull up three point sniper that this team kind of needs in the backcourt. It's really the only thing this roster is missing is that sort of archetype of a player. And I, I've kind of compared him like on, on a floor side to like maybe like a Terrence Ross, but maybe on a ceiling side, more like an athletic CJ McCollum who who can kind of get up for big dunks, but has just a really versatile scoring attack as a mid-range pull-up assassin and the three-point range, hitting tough shots from all over the court. And that that could be exactly what this team needs, especially as kind of like Gary and and KCP maybe age out of their primes and and Jet ages into his. And that could be a real dynamic offensive weapon for Orlando, who really already has their, their core guys set up down the line. And I think Anthony Black will step in as really the ultimate role player for this team. And he, he's the kind of plug-and-play guy that could really help any team. He's, he's a strong defensive playmaker, really smart, 
team defender and point of attack defender. You could call him a point guard. You could call him a connector. Uh, you can call him a wing. Like he, he could he could really play like one through three in a lot of different roles as kind of this point tall point forward type who basically just makes smart passes, makes good reads. Like you said, he can hit the open three, even if it's low volume, He can he's not afraid to shoot it. And he brings effort and energy and, and smart play on both ends every night. So he, he's the exact type of role player you would want around star players like Franz and Paulo. And ideally, you know, a comp for him has been Derek White because of that kind of all around play. So hopefully maybe he, he continues to grow into a bigger role and just is able to excel in, in a similar way as, as him. And um, I, I'd say he's probably the, the best available of these three young players right away, but we'll, we'll see, mm. I guess, who, who really pops out. And because, like, De Silva, like you said, should have a high floor right away. Like, he's a 6'8 forward with a 6'10 wingspan, a smart team defender. And one big thing for him is his off-ball cutting. Like, he's a really smart off-ball mover who's, like, a, a also really versatile. He, he has great shooting indicators, 84%. His senior year on three free throws a game, 79% on two free throws over his entire career at Colorado, 40% three-point percentage on five threes a game in his senior season, and 39% on three threes per game through the whole career. He shows scoring versatility with um, one point per possession in six different play types as a junior and five as a senior, like cuts, transitions, spot-ups, handoffs, post-ups, isos, and pick-and-roll ball handler. He, like he he knows it just high level two way feel like he he's he's not going to hurt you in many ways. It, it, I guess his defensive impact would probably be the biggest hole to attack at first. So we'll see if he builds that strength and the mobility and agility to really like uh, carve out a role where he if he's good on defense he just can't be benched because he's too good not to play. And he has like a, a cool little go to move that you'll see where he he's hitting Dirk fades from like the elbow and it's kind of his go-to is posting up over a mismatch when he has the height advantage and he he's, he's confident in that shot where if he get if he gets the switch he can get a little dirk fade on the elbow over just about anybody with a really tall shot release so that off ball movement is pretty rare for like a player his size like just knowing where to be and and to cut like that constantly and that that's kind of what you need is someone who can shoot the three attack closeouts, move off the ball around the, Absolutely. the core in place. So he brings a lot, and we'll see how it, if it translates right away, which is certainly possible because of his age and his experience at the college level. And, you know, if it takes a little bit, then that's what it takes because he's, he's still a rookie, and this is a playoff team expecting to improve. So, you know, the, you, you got to have pretty high expectations for who's actually going to play. We, at some point, this, this team went from, like, trying to get development reps for guys to – like it's time to ball and it's time to win. Like if, if you're not ready to play two way winning basketball, if, if you have a hole in your game that the other team can attack, you might not play. And that, that could be the reason some of them didn't play as much last year, but there's definitely a lot more opportunity with, you know, Fultz is now gone and Joe Ingles is not here anymore. And they were pretty much key rotation players last year and years prior for Fultz. So somebody has got to fill in that role. And, and these are some of the guys that could step up and, and do it right away. And, We'll see how it translates. And that's why we're so excited about this Magic Young Court because even, even regardless of if they can have instant impact this year, it's the archetype of what they could become, the development and the progression, right? And seeing them get their opportunities, even if it's in the NBA or the G League, these are the players that are going to matter so much in this new CBA era where you need to draft guys who can, you know, hit for you and become a part of your rotation in the coming year. So that stuff should be very interesting overall to monitor. But that does take us to our last question before we power rank the Magic and the Eastern Conference. Franz Wagner, I got to be honest, as someone in the NBA circle, um, there's been a lot of chatter about Franz. After he signed that Magic extension, a lot of people said that he didn't deserve it. A lot of people think that he's not a great player anymore because he had a down year for his standards. Even then, he still gave you good overall production. In the playoffs, he wasn't great. I can agree to that. But I think a lot of people just don't know what to think of Franz. Some people 
said that he's no longer the best player on the team. They think it's Paolo now. As Magic fans, what do you guys think about Franz? Do you think the noise is really just BS? What do you think Franz can really accomplish this season for the Magic moving forward? Man, um, you know, I think when you look at Franz Wagner, it's it's not necessarily like a game that sticks out and in a, like in a sexy way. Um, I mean, he's got a very smooth game and it's very good. Like he has such a versatile finisher around the rim. Um, he's a very smart driver. He's got a phenomenal Euro step. It's, it's pretty like unbeatable that Euro that he's got. Um, but you know, he's not throwing down these like crazy flashy dunks and stuff like that. And, and, and he struggled from three last year, which is, which is something like people really like, love to vitalize on visually so i think that's why like some players are or some people are like kind of sleeping on him a bit but he's a he's a gifted passer you know he's a he's a growing playmaker um he's only gotten better every year with his uh driving and finishing around the rim uh he's a good defender he's he's definitely like he's not elite defender but he's a very good perimeter defender um and can handle switches very fine on all sorts of different types of players um you know positions and size so like he's just very very well-rounded right and i think when you look at a player who like him and he just got and and this entire draft class Cade, evan mobley um scotty barnes like this entire draft class that just got these maxes it's like they're not max players today not a single one of those players is a max player today but you're giving them that rookie max extension because you believe they will develop into a max player and like Franz is not too, too far off from that, right? You know, let's polish up that three a bit more. Let's continue to improve that playmaking. Um, and let's get a little bit of a mid-range game going. And he's going to be talked about as a max rookie player very, very soon if those things start to come together, right? He doesn't got to be a 40% shooter from three, but could he get back to that 36, 37% level that we all sort of expected him to be there? Um you know, he is a guy that doesn't get a lot of rest in the summers because he plays every single summer for his, uh, you know, country, the, the German national team. So, like, you know, and there were some rumors that he was dealing with some injuries too last year around his ankle and stuff like that, and that never quite healed, right? So we'll see what happens. You know, he definitely has some things to prove. Um, there were times during big games where you wish he would show up a little bit more and he didn't, but there was also plenty of times during big games. I think like game five remind me RK during the playoffs where he like owned that game and really took over and is a big reason why the magic won that game. Um, so just like, um, just wanted to say like, even if he's like not the best second option he's going to be a very 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 overqualified third option when this team gets into a championship mode and that is exactly the type of player you believe in and you you build trust in and and you invest in financially by giving him a max contract and what's great is this max contract is not going to get the magic in trouble yes it's a lot of money the cap is going to go up every single year it's still only going to be 25 percent of the cap um, unless he makes all nba team and then, um, you know, from there, if he is not that max player, he won't get a non-rookie extension max. He'll get a very good contract, but it won't be that, oh shit, we just gave this guy, you know, 30% of the team's cap space for the next five years. So anyways, long story less long, Franz is going to be just fine. He's a very polished, very competitive, good player. Um, would love to see that three pointer get a little bit better. And I, and I love that they invested in him. Didn't mess around. Um, no player option on that fifth year. So team's got full control over it and it'll be really good to see how he continues to grow next to this nice young magic roster in Paulo Bencaro. No doubt. I, I think the France topic is interesting because there's, like you said, there's like a handful of criticisms that have really kind of taken over his narrative, I guess, as a player. And yeah, um, I I think it's it's mostly undeserved. Like I, I I would say that to me, he is almost as much of an all star. Like he's the one B to one Apollo's one A. Like at the bare minimum, they might not be co stars quite yet, but but Franz shows up almost just as much and just as often like he, he'll have big games consistently when Paulo is not yet feeling it 
there are games where Franz is, and he's the one that carries the offense. He's the one that carries us. Like you mentioned, he, he carries Germany's team as their best player during the summers. He literally won the whole thing for FIBA, the World Cup, last summer. And he, he's, you know, Schroeder, FIBA Schroeder, obviously, like, runs that team's Hooper. offense a lot, Hooper. too. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a bucket over there, a whole other player. But, but like, Franz is, is the guy, and he was second overall in total points of any player behind Jokic this summer during, during the Olympics. And the thing about Franz's narrative really is two, two things. He doesn't show up in big games, and that three-point shooting is not where you want it to be. And I think it kind of works against him because he's so good at everything else. Like the three-point shooting would just make him a clear all-star or a clear, like, like clear one of the best players because he's already a high-impact defender, a smart drive-and-kick player, like a finesse finisher. He draws fouls. And looking at the playoffs, he gets killed for the Game 7. He, he had six points in Game 7, and everyone kind of throws that on him as he can't handle an elimination game. But if you, like, flip, if you that's only true if you don't, consider all the elimination games where he balled out. We, we were down 2-1 in the series in game four, and he had 34 points, while Paulo only had nine. He, he, he's the one that, and if you go down 3-1 in a series, no team has ever come back. Well, that's not true, but uh, I think it was, I might have it wrong, but it might. I think they were down 2-1 at that time, so it would have been 3-1. Very few teams have come back, obviously Le- LeBron's right. um, team and all that, but he had 34 in the game four, and then in the ne- in the actual elimination game, the one we got to see in person, he had 26 points in in the game six at home, where he he came up and showed out. He six went 11 awesome. for 11 from the line, like it was a, a huge moment where where he showed up. And you know, game game seven, he missed his shots. He didn't he, he didn't quite win it, and th- that's just the break sometimes. But even going back to the FIBA World Cup, like and the Olympics, he's playing in constant elimination games against huge players like he he was up against Giannis uh, to make the final four in the Olympics and he knocked him out a, a team with Giannis is the best player so that that to me is like it, it's a very small sample size picking the the one bad example and not really comparing it against the whole because he averaged 21 points a game in the first six games he just had a bad game seven and like to me that is overblown that part but obviously the three-point shooting is something he has to improve it's just it, it's it's not there at the moment and he probably gets a knock because you know he, he's kind of like like you said he, he's not necessarily hitting fadeaway jumpers all the time even though he will hit a step back three or throw down a monster poster slam every once in a while like it, it might not be as aesthetically pleasing as paulo so he's kind of not he, he kind of holds a little bit more criticism when when the shots aren't falling in comparison. So I think that, you know, he, he's well deserving of a max because he's a star young player and what arguably in a redraft would go number one or at least top five in, in that draft with Sangoon, Mobley, Scotty Barnes, Cade, Suggs now. And, you know, like clearly he's right there. But in terms of the best player on the Magic, I'm still leaning Paulo. Paulo is, you know, I think on a superstar's tra- trajectory, there just aren't really many players that do what he does. Like, I-, I think two very reliable forms of offensive shot creation is what both of them are good at, but especially Paulo, free throw line and driving into the paint. Paulo averaged seven free throws a game, which was ninth overall, and 12.7 drives per game, which is 21st overall per uh, last season. And only eight players drive to the rack and get to the line more often than Paulo. And they're all stars. Giannis, Shea, Luca, Trey, Zion, yep. Dame, Damar, Jimmy. And I think the, you know, we, we hope to see, I think Zion is, is kind of the hopeful, like, outcome for Paulo's production. If, if you just look at last year, they were really identical in a lot of ways. They averaged, both averaged, like, seven free throws a game, around the same amount of points per game. And to me, Zion's efficiency was much higher and his impact was much higher because he had a better shot selection. Zion was basically taking all of his field goals right at the rim, while Paulo takes a lot of tough twos and tough fadeaway twos. So if if Paulo either takes less of those tough twos or just makes more of them, you could see his efficiency and impact get to that superstar level. Like there, there is a pathway to that. Agreed. And, you know, that... I, I just think Fr- Franz did, gets a lot of hate for that one game, and it, it's tough when that's kind of the last memory everyone has of you. 
going into the off season that that that's what they think is is the underperformance because like to me he showed up every game but that one and and was consistent like 18 points 18 points 16 points 34 points 14 points 26 points in the playoffs like they, he didn't really have a bad game before that last moment where he, he he did he only had six in that in that one so he missed his shots and you got to live with it learn from it and like you mentioned before KCP's experience could be really valuable to to know how to get it done on the biggest stage Absolutely. and to not get beat up over one low moment where you you learn from it and and maybe he shows you the way like when when you see the shoulder shrug and he's looking down like maybe KCP can kind of just tell him like it's not not to over overblow one bad moment and just stick to the game plan and just stay consistent in what we do and and hope that it it all works out in the end. Yeah, I think that Franz has has a, a lot of things going on with his name off of one season, but I think Franz is still a very talented player. I think there's a lot of good things that he does for a team. Overseas, you saw a lot of that game to game to game, a lot of wire to wire games where he showed up big. I think for this season, he will have a bounce back year for sure. And if he does, that means a lot of good things for the Magic, which takes us to the final topic for this podcast, which, by the way, gentlemen, shout out for us having another long pod like last year. Love that. With all our conversation about the young core, the defense, Franz, Paolo, Jed Howard, Jonathan Isaac, where do you guys have this Magic team in the Eastern Conference this year? I know last year um, it was more conservative, this and that, but with the additions that you've seen from this Magic team and – to your point, how competitive it was last year, how they could have been a top four seed last year. Where do you have the Magic slotting into this new Eastern Conference with Paul George and other new players coming over to the East? Man, it's a uh, it's a hard one because the East got better, right? At least the top of the East got better. Um, you know, the Knicks resigned OG, traded for Bridges. They're going to be a really good team. The Celtics. Rolling, running it back, best team in the league last year, won a championship, really hard team to beat. 76ers added Paul George um, and some nice complimentary veterans. Their depth is not super great, but they have at least an eight-man rotation, which is which is is kind of all you need when, when it really comes down to it. Um, and then you have uh, the Bucks, the other the other big team of the East. Giannis, always a threat. Um, that team's getting older, um, and so their luck is really going ch- to be reliant on health, just like really any team. But they're going to have a full season with um, a full off season in training camp with a coaching staff that joined halfway through the season last year, which is always challenging. So I'm not going to say the Magic are going to be a top four seed because if all those teams are healthy and things go right for all of them, including the Magic, that's going to be really, really, really tough. Uh, but they should be five. They should be top five pretty easily. And let's be real, nothing goes perfect for every single team in the East. So there's going to be some battle with, you know, maybe the Bucks dealing with some injuries or, you know, Embiid and Paul George are pretty injury riddled throughout the regular season. Um, the Even the Knicks have some injury riddled guys on their roster that are, you know, have a bit of a mixed history of being able to play throughout the whole season. So there could be a good chance for the Magic to be a top four seed in the East, in my perspective. Um, but, but it's not going to necessarily be easy. They have to take the step up that they are as a team. They have to, uh, you know, players have to hit their next step in development. Um, you know, that means Paulo has got to be a better playmaker with less turnovers and more efficient scoring. That means Jalen Suggs has to continue to shoot at the clip he does and grow his playmaking. Franz has to continue to grow as we just talked about. Um, and that second unit needs to continue to just like thrive with these younger players taking a step in a bigger role in this team. So, um, yeah, top four is like our top five is my prediction with a very strong chance uh, of being a top four team. Yeah, that's fair. And the, the playoffs were super tight last year, like you mentioned. I mean, Boston was ahead of everybody in net rating and, and in win total. But two through eight were only a difference of – four games this two seed won four more games than the eight seed last year like i I think the eastern playoffs are are pretty even in that sense and when you look at the outside looking in like the uh, maybe the hawks got a little more depth and more balance but you you don't really see the bulls or the hawks and the nets or the raptors making a, a giant jump to overtake any of the teams ahead of them so like the floor should really be the playoffs and now it's a play in if you're a seven or eight seed 
But like that, that shouldn't be the biggest disappointment if that's where you end up when the win totals are are so close between two through eight. And but like you said, every other team got better, and um, the only other one is Siakam as well uh, on the Pacers that was halfway through the year. So Siakam and Lillard in Milwaukee now have that full off season to kind of get in tune with their yep. teams as well and, and prepare. So you know that's something to watch out for. Where basically every team in the East got got better. So. If Orlando just is just as good as they were last year, I, I think that's a successful season. And it's totally, you know, within their their right as a locker room to think they're going to improve again and get, get even better because they're all pretty young. They're all developing. They're all ri- multiple rising stars, and they improve the roster, especially with KCP like we mentioned before. And, you know, Paulo was just on first take talking about expectations. Like, he, he set the bar at home court advantage. He thinks they're as good as anyone in the, the league cause, or in the East because they were right there. I mean, the two seed had 50 wins and the eight seed had 46 wins. Like, there, a slight margin is what ended up deciding that they, they were the five seed. And, you know, there's no reason to think Orlando can't carry over exactly as good of a team that they had last year. And I would say... You know, the Knicks really improved a lot to me. The Sixers added a superstar in Paul George, or at least a you know a former one who's now an All Star. And so, you know, the and and the Bucks should have the best pick and roll in the league when when they finally have Dame and, and Giannis in sync, and if Middleton can stay healthy. And you know, every team deals with injuries. It, it was definitely not, if anything, Orlando had one of their better years with injuries, while the other ones did not. But it, they still faced. A, a ton of injuries to key rotation players throughout the year, like everyone does, but it's something that hopefully their depth can handle. So, you know, it, they have to get a few lucky breaks like any other year, but I think they should carry themselves as a top four team because they were a five seed right there with them. And like if they happen to fall five through eight again, like there's nothing wrong with that when the team, is, when the league is so close in that, in that range. So, like their goal should be the two seed because they they were within that range last year, and reaching Boston at this point is probably a little unrealistic compared to the rest of the goals because Boston's just set up to be a perennial playoff contender for years to come. I mean they're just loaded with top end talent and and two way depth and and you know former stars around their current stars and you know just the ultimate floor balance of where Orlando hopes to get where you just build a roster full of guys that don't have holes that where you can't really attack them in any one way. They can all space the floor, dribble, pass and shoot, defend well for their positions, defend other positions and bring a little scoring versatility like Drew has yeah. before as an ISO threat and Chris Stapps does as the fifth option as a pick and pop mismatch hunter hitting elbow fadeaways over people. So, you know, Orlando should want to get there eventually, but you know, I, I think that two through four seed should definitely be the goal. And they shouldn't be disappointed if it ends up five through eight again because they're right in the hunt. And that that definitely, you know, we, we definitely see now more than ever that they can they can even make the finals as an eight seed, just like the Heat did not too long ago. I mean, it's not as unrealistic as it used to be, but they, they can definitely, you know, gradual development. And I think one of the best hopes is that Orlando's increased their win total by like 10 wins a game or uh, wins per season, like every year since Mosley took over, like. They, they just keep jumping up these huge jumps by maintaining that defensive efficiency, that resiliency, and that development that we, we've touched on throughout the pod. And there's no reason to think they, they won't continue to do it. So I think having they only hit 47 wins last year. I think aiming for that 50-win season is a great goal, a great mark to have, and hopefully they, they get a little luck go their way to be able to pull it off. Absolutely. I love the analysis from our rk and steven on where the magic are going to be seating i'll make my pick fast these stats to me bowl well in 21 22 the magic's offense was 30th ranked in the league 104.7 points per possession their defense was 17th you then move on to 2022 23 now it becomes a 26th ranked offense 111.8 points per possession uh then they have the 11th ranked defense 114.2 then you get to last year that offense jumps from 26 to 22 and their defense jumps from 11 to 2. so what you're seeing is offense and defense 
year after year after year get better. The formula for them to be a top four seed in the East is first off durability, but if they can get that offense to maybe 17, 18 with the best defense in the league, I don't think that's crazy. I think that their biggest claim to fame is they're younger than all these other teams with the Bucks outside of the Knicks, but the Knicks have a lot of problems as well, injury concern, right? But overall, I think the Magic have the formula to reach that. I love how you guys so eloquently put why they had that claim to it. And I think the Magic are going to be a legitimate team. I can't wait to watch how they look in this overall season. We could see a Franz revenge season just just like we could see Apollo superstar breakout year. These things are possible. So I can't wait to see what that looks like. Um, <laughs> but yeah, guys, I really appreciate you doing the pod, Steve. We've been here for a super duper long time, but I love the conversations we have year after year after year. And I can't wait to watch Orlando Magic Basketball for this year. Any closing words for the pod, fellas? Yeah, it's not a revenge season for Franz Wagner. He had an awesome season last year. It's <laughs> going to be an even better season, all right? The only thing that didn't improve in his game last year was his shooting. Everything else did improve. So... Let's get that out of the way, people. <laughs> um, yeah, no, nah, man, really psyched to be here. Really appreciate it. It's going to be a really fun season. Always happy to talk uh, basketball, uh, Orlando Magic basketball specifically. And you can catch me on Twitter at uh, Steven, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Magic HQ, um, or at Orlando Magic HQ. That's where you can find me and all my work Uh you know, hit me up if you want to talk smack or give some hot takes. Let's go. Thanks for having me, Gifted. It is good talking, Steven. And Fine. Like yeah, you- sorry. Thanks for joining too. Like, it's always a pleasure talking with you. We do not do this often enough. You know what? Let's, let's keep it going anytime. Always down to talk magic hoops and appreciate the opportunity here. And like, like you said, I, I think the defense carries over with the personnel coming back and the schemes coming back and the offense. You can see the what carries over the most to me is the driving kick and the free throws. Like you know, Paulo and Franz are going to be driving and kicking, creating free throws, creating looks at the rim, and creating three point looks for others all day, every day. And those two factors are reliable half court shot creation and reliable defensive impact from from their their top talent. And those that's what really carries them season to season and should carry them and be able to grow out from there. So it, hopefully we see another jump and they're, they're right there with every other top team in the East and just appreciate talking hoops. I always love talking basketball and scouting and NBA and especially the magic. Thanks for taking the time guys. You can uh, find me on uh, Twitter, Substack, YouTube and swish theory at beyond the RK and always a pleasure. Absolutely. Appreciate you guys for coming on the pod two years in a row. Can't wait to see what the Magic do this year. I have all of their links and whatnot in the description box below. Appreciate anyone who made it to the end of this podcast. We're going through all 30 teams. And the Magic are a team to watch out for next year. So peep game, watch basketball. And remember, appreciate the sport that we get to watch on a year-to-year basis. Things shift so dramatically. But appreciate you guys. Have a good one. This podcast can be found on Spotify and Apple Podcasts at the Gift News Podcast. We're out of here. Have a good one, people.